Hello, and welcome to the women's show. First time we've been back in a while because uh, there's fixtures and the, the joy of women's football. But I'm joined by once again Neil Axon from the Anfield Wrap, and I've got Emma from BBC. How are we doing, guys? Very well indeed. Yeah, good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good. 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 So um, we were going to talk about Charlton and how big a game it was going to be, but you know, as as is the way, um, that, that plan got Kai Bosch because it's now been moved to probably February now. So. I was a little bit of a blow, but so instead, Neil, we'll just have to concentrate on a, a fantastic month for the Reds. You know, lots of wins and basically now four points clear. Yeah, I think the first thing to say about the weekend's game is it ends up actually putting a lot of pressure uh, on the sides that are close to us, the two sides that are close to us, both London City, uh, Crystal Palace and Durham all very much need to take advantage of the fact that we're not playing. Now, all three of them are at home, but there's no guarantee uh, across those games that they're going to, you know, be able to find an absolute walk in the park. I did notice that, you know, there was, st- that, you know, there's there's room for for sides still to find things a little bit difficult at this time of year. And I think, you know, it, it, there's a general issue around where COVID is in a number of different ways at this stage. But I think that, that that's what that's what that does. You know, we're not playing at the same time as them. And if any one of them drops points, then they will feel as though they've missed a real opportunity to put some pressure on Liverpool. And if all three of them do, which would be a dream street, then Liverpool are in a, in a nice position there. Um, I think in general, you know, for the first time, and, and, and it should have happened uh, earlier, but this team's now unbeaten in 13. And I think that, you know, at any level of any sport, to be quite frank, but at any level of football, you know, even when you are the better side in a division, to be unbeaten in 13 shows, you know, remarkable fortitude. And I think that that's one of the things that you've got to take away from this team. I think it's ended up, and it's credit goes to the manager. You know, we've talked a lot about whether or not he sort of stumbles onto the shape or anything like that. But the one thing he doesn't stumble onto from the from the summer onwards is trying to inject these players with the sort of certainty and focus that they can meet their targets this season. You know, that was coming through all the pre-season stuff. When I went to interview a couple, the focus was on. How are we gonna are we gonna get promoted? Yes, we are. What's that gonna take? Well, we're gonna do this, this, and this. This is how quickly we think we can move the ball quicker than our rivals. And for me, that's you know, it's a huge achievement. 13 unbeaten. And if they do make it 14 in the Conti Cup on Wednesday night, then it'll I think you know it doesn't matter if they win or draw. I think they're then through to the next phase of that. They're in the last into the fourth round of the FA Cup, which is where the, the top flight teams come and get involved as well. From a Liverpool point of view, you know, the, there's opportunity for them to test themselves while simultaneously doing the job that's right in front of them. So I I, I think you can't you can't have asked for any more. And I think we're we're fortunate, not fortunate, sorry, we're we're fortunate as supporters at the moment, but they're getting what they deserve for the graft of put in. Couldn't couldn't agree more. I mean the big the big the two big games when we, we previewed them last time was um Durham away and Sunderland away. They were the two big probably big tests for Liverpool and there was a slight probably mild concern going into the Durham game because we had drawn with Blackburn who were a bit of a bogey side for us. Aside on paper you were you would thought Liverpool would do well. There was the contentious, you know, was it, wasn't it over the line? If you haven't seen it, uh, Liverpool look like they've scored. It looks miles over the line. Unless you're an official, then you can't see it. So it's one. Of, it felt like one of those games. And the frustration as a Liverpool fan is we've only actually seen two goals at the cop at like the cop end version of Brenton Park. All the goals we see at home were all the other end. So you always feel, you feel doubly robbed at the moment. But um, let's talk about Durham though. The Durham game, you know. Axa put on a coach for Liverpool. I think thirty-five fans uh, went up. I went up with Olivia. Philip joined us as well, and uh, that was a hell. Of, that was a hell of a journey. Hell, a good day, really, all round. And Liverpool, as they do, took over. Yeah, I think it was really important because we spoke in the last show about the fact that they had. I think it was five games in seventeen days um, in November, including that that away trip to to Durham. So it was yeah, it was massively important. Um, it was important that the fans were there to enjoy it there to support and also make a difference but it, in terms of you know the actual standings at the top of the table I think mentally that's massive that win over Durham was just so dominant I think it was the manner in which they won as well it wasn't just a case of getting three points on the board and you know doing doing what they needed to get the win it was actually quite comfortable and I think they put a real statement down to the rest of the league that we are the you know we are the best team in the league and we're now top of the table and you're going to have to really catch us and basically you can't afford to drop any more points if you want to catch us that was the kind of message that it felt like it had sent now I remember speaking to Matt at the beginning of the season after the first game um, you know where it was disappointing and I I said you know how many more results of these can you afford to have and he said well actually perhaps in the past where you could have only afforded to drop maybe two or three games in terms of losses and maybe the odd draw 
in the championship. The standard now is so high that other teams are dropping points. And I sort of was like, mm, not sure about that. But I think it's been shown already that the teams in and around the top have dropped points. I don't think Liverpool can afford to drop anymore. But the fact that they not only are starting to pick up points, you know, Blackburn aside, pick up points against the teams that they should be beating. They're now putting in really dominant, you know, statement performances against the teams at the top. And that's what you have to do if you want to get into the WSL, because, you know, we spoke about it before. It's not, yes, Liverpool want to get promoted. Yes, their, their priority is to get promoted into the WSL. But they also want to be a team that when they get into the WSL, aren't going to be embarrassed, aren't going to come straight back down. I think that's equally as important. I think the 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 Durham thing was first and foremost was that they went and won the right to play, and I think that that was that was always going to be the concern from what what's gone on in the past in that fixture, and from 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 minute one, you know, there's there's there's, there's a high Rachel Furness tackle, frankly, that she throws in all but from the kickoff, and it was very much this is what's happening today. This game happens the way we want it to happen, and we're having absolutely every we're we're dominating every facet of this, and then they grew and grew. And it was an excellent defensive rear guard action, really, from Durham that kept it at nil nil at half time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it really felt like Durham had had to hang on for dear life. And then they came out and they improved a tiny little bit, Durham for 15 to 20. Uh, and they, they, they managed to pin Liverpool back a little bit. They played a lot in the channel uh, down Liverpool's left, Durham's right. And they made it a little bit difficult for the three at the back uh, with between, I think it was the gap between uh, Matthews and Hines. And they, they managed to sort of make life a bit awkward for Liverpool. But then Liverpool just came again and got themselves right back on the front foot and strangled the game. And and, you know, it is it is a facet of football. Sometimes you've got to outfight them, and sometimes you've got to you've got to outplay them. And against Durham, Liverpool did both. And I think that that bodes really, really well. I think Emma's wider point, and you know, the club's in a funny position at the minute because I think everyone needs to focus on the job in hand that's right in front of them. But there are, you know, you look up WSL. And at the very foot of the WSL, there are two really strong salutary tales from a Liverpool point of view. Liverpool can't go through all this um, in, in the sense of, you know, trying to generate interest, excitement, get us all right behind this team. If they're going to go up and suffer a similar fate to Birmingham and Leicester, that's not the same as mm-hmm. saying Liverpool, you know, if they go up, they should be challenging for the league titles year one. It's not the same as that. But, you know, you look at Birmingham and Leicester at the minute and there's one point between the two of them after nine or is it 10 games, Emma? Mm-hmm. And, and it's... Mm-hmm. It's it's they play each other very very soon, so they can't both lose. Although it feels as though they might have a good go, but you end up you end up in a situation there where you know that's not that that just is not a load of fun for anyone. And I think it is you know it's 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 easy for us to you know for us to say that now you know the club's got to focus on the job in hand and it's got to get the job in hand done. But there already doesn't it maybe need to be a little eye on that because you know it's it's the worst thing about football in a sense. It's very much what have you done for me lately. Mm-hmm. And if Liverpool do get themselves up, then you know we don't want to be traipsing off to Prenton Park every week thinking, well, how many are we going to get beat by? We want to be going to Prenton Park thinking, at the very least, we can give these a game. And as I say, this isn't about Liverpool coming first, second or third. It's about Liverpool competing and coming sixth, seventh and eighth in year one. And I think that that's going to be, that's going to be the challenge that's in front of them. But what January now offers, possibly from a Liverpool point of view, is maybe the opportunity, if they've got their eye on a couple, to either get in ahead of a rival uh, for, a, for, for a player who could well add to finishing this season strongly. You know, in the same way that Kerry Holland is one of Liverpool's most important players, that she comes in last January and she's been one of Liverpool's most important players this season. Are there a couple that they could look to get in who can who can add to the promotion push now, but who can also look to sustain uh, WSL football next season? It's, it's something for Liverpool to think about. It is the next phase of this. But in the meantime, you know, to go to Durham and win, the side who I think we all expect to finish at the very least in the top four, to go there and win, is absolutely massive, and and I saw Liverpool against Crystal Palace. They look comfortably better than them. And then there's the London City question. Definitely, yeah. London City seem to be um, the one to watch at the moment. Um, I, for my sins, decided last minute Friday night, let's drive up, to, let's let's get in a car and go to Sunderland. Uh, Emma from the uh, so from the Joe from the Liverpool Sports London side, she drives, so I jumped in. It's the coldest place I think I've ever been to. Oh, yeah, I can unreal. I can agree with that. that I got that, stuck there for three days. <laughs> That is an unreal level of cold. Um, but what I liked about this, and I could, pro- and I, and I don't say this tongue in cheek, is the best thing that happened to Liverpool was they went one nil down in that game, and Liverpool changed instantly from a nice side to we're going to be a serious side now, and we're going to go, and you're not going to live with this. And it was almost like it was like the old the old adage of the worst thing you can do is score against us because as soon as Liverpool conceded. 
they went up a level and they just hammered the goal. I mean, the Sunderland goalkeeper, that's probably one of the best goalkeeper performers I've seen for a while because they hit the bar, they hit the post, and you're just watching this going, this is coming, this is going. And I can hear Sunderland fans at the end of me going, oh, well, listen, they only beat us by one second half. And they were going, wait, like that, that's the moral victory is we only lost by one second half. And it's a while since I've heard Liverpool women talked about or seen in that way. It was almost like getting beat one on the second half was like a bit of a moral victory, really. And that was kind of a, that shows the mindset and the, the, the switch in how, how they see themselves now, which is the biggest positive I could take from the games at the moment. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point because even just speaking to, um, you know, other people at other clubs, it there is that general feeling now, whereas last season, Liverpool had a weakness and I think everyone sensed that weakness. It was quite clear the marker that was put down by Durham on that opening day was that Liverpool were there to be get at, uh, there to be got at, and and they absolutely were last season. And there wasn't that fight, there wasn't that fight, that wasn't that kind of know how of how to win games in the championship. And as Neil said before, they've now merged the quality that was always evident within the team, that was always evident there last season. They've merged that now with a bit of experience and just a little bit of um, yeah, a little bit of feistiness that perhaps wasn't there before. Um, I think that comes with maturity both in the league and also with the players. Uh, there was a lot of turnaround, obviously, going into ch- into that championship season last season, whereas now they are a bit more tight-knit. Um, Matt has come in. He himself is very experienced. He knows how to, you know, just grind out results and, and win games. So there is that kind of, um, yeah, I guess as there's that superiority which Liverpool didn't have last season, which teams are now starting to sense. And that performance against Sunderland backed up the one against Durham, where it was a case of the Durham one wasn't, oh, we can just get up for the big games. It was, no, 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 you know, we're going to be at this level. This is our level and this is a consistency that we're going to have going into every game. I remember the Conti Cup game, um, trying to think who who it was, maybe, um, I don't know, was it against Villa maybe, when um, Liverpool won on a penalty shootout and I remember speaking to Matt afterwards and I was like, yeah, brilliant. I, you know, top of the Conti Cup group, unbeaten, it's a WSL side, uh, finished nil nil after 90 minutes. What are your thoughts on that? And he was like, it wasn't good enough, like straight away. And he was like, he was angry because he was the, he was the same against uh, Blackburn at home. Where, yeah, and he name checked Man, uh, Man City, Arsenal, and Chelsea. He said, if we want to be like them, you watch yeah. how they control the ball. So they don't let that second go in. Said so they make that three and four, and said, and they don't take the foot off the throat. He said, yeah. I know to change sides. So I'm, I made it. We won. He said. But that's something we've got to learn. We've got to put the foot in the throat and don't give people a sniff, which I think is it's, it's kind of an ideal situation for a manager because you've won, which is great, but then you can still go, but we can go better. It's harder to do that message when you've just got beat 2-0 and go, oh, we could do better because you kind of feel like that anyway because you got beat. The fact you you can say after every win, it's good, but you've got a level you've got a level or two higher to go and I know you can do it. So it's a, it's a nice added challenge. Um, and the big thing we've seen, I mean, we'll talk, talk cover it in the agenda is, Squad depth is A, returning, but B, through this whole month, you've seen the benefits of the squad depth. You know, we, we lost Charlotte Wardlaw, who'd been brilliant the previous month. Raza Roberts comes in and she just gives you something different, but you don't look at you don't look any weaker. I mean, Raza was the, the two key assists against Durham. That's all that that's all you needed. You know, Taylor Hines, you know, can now just seem to just, just do headed goals every game. Just seems to be a thing now, as it just comes in back post and heads it, you know. I don't know why we didn't drive this trick before because it works really, really, really well. But it's it's taken the pressure off um, Leanne Kiernan because you were worried going, well, Leanne doesn't score, who scores? Sunderland, you know, the equaliser's Yarda Daniels, you know, who's doing a job for us at full back, uh, wing back at times. So we're now starting to get people in different positions chipping in, you know. So now, I mean, Leanne Kiernan is still scoring also for fun, which is brilliant, but there's not the pressure. She has to be the main goal threat now. We're now going, there's two or three now we can start to chip in, which is good. Mm. So, no, yeah, so no, I mean, just on the, the chipping in, I think it's really important. I think Yarn is a good shout within in amongst that. That it felt a little bit like she was a grafter who wasn't going to stick it into the back of the net. I think the other thing to point out as well is Mel Lowley scores against Sunderland. She ends up getting a couple, albeit one from a set piece last night. Mm. But I think. You know, I think that the the idea that sorry on Sunday, I think the idea that Mel, you know, Mel is a really good example of someone who's just growing and growing in confidence consistently. And yes, Burnley, you know, they're not uh, they're not a championship side, but I think I think the idea that Mel's in a position to to be part of a Liverpool team that puts them to the sword is genuinely really useful. I think you know, I think that it's it's something that builds on her talent 
and the fact that she can, you know, against get, we've seen it so far in, the, in not just in the uh, in the league, but also in the Conti Cup. You know, she can really, really hurt teams. And I think that the more that she's doing that, and the more that the ball ends up in the back of the net with her name next to it, then I think the better it bodes for Liverpool. In general, I think that that's, you know, sharing the goals around does matter. I think, you know, the, the best way to share the goals around is that Leanne Keenan doesn't stop scoring and she mm-hmm. can keep scoring, but everyone else can be chipping in here and there. And if, you know, if, if Liverpool end the season where where she's scored, you know, let's just hypothetically say 33% of Liverpool's goals, but she's top scorer in the division, Liverpool will go up. It's as straightforward mm-hmm. as that. And that's, you know, that, that I think that's a really, it, it, it's, it's a good way for Liverpool to be. So every single time I think somebody else is chipping in, I think it's a good thing. But I think it also, it, it's this idea of consistently breathing good habits. And that's what I would characterise the club as having done since the summer, to be honest with you. I think there's been a lot of breathing good habits right the way across the pitch and you're seeing the benefits. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just jump in because I think I think this is something that Matt did, does deserve credit in. It's also that rotation of the squad, just to kind of maintain the competitiveness, keep the squad depth and... Um, you know, it was something that I said I was a bit worried about in the transfer market. I wasn't sure about the, you know, whether or not we were improving the starting eleven. But actually, by improving the squad, which he's absolutely done, um, I think it has improved the starting eleven because it's provided the competitiveness that perhaps wasn't there last season. I think last season you could probably choose your starting eleven to th- to fourteen pretty easily, whereas now, you know, there's there's a good five or six, maybe seven players that you can bring in and rotate. And I don't think the quality drops off too much. It's more a question of the system or the style of play that, that would change. Because we've seen in the cup games, Liverpool still putting out really, really strong teams, actually, when, mm. when Matt's made, you know, seven or eight changes. So I think that's something that's really pleasing. And I think, yeah, I think he has to take credit for that because, um, yeah, clearly, as I say, five games in 17 days and to still be unbeaten. Yeah, he deserves some credit for that. Yeah, I mean, sticking on the squad depth side, uh, we saw Megan Campbell make her first appearance of the season, which was, uh, I was looking at her interview a week or so ago, she was really keen to get on. And again, that's somebody who, it's now an option that if we want to, we can actually give, uh, say, Tyler Hines, uh, Taylor Hines a rest, which was oh, which has been my only niggle with the side is, we haven't really got a proper another left back. And that was the problem last year was Tyler Hines got round to the ground. And she's, I mean, you don't want to take her out the ball, she's brilliant, but you now can take her out of County Cup games and FA Cup games because you've got such experience in Megan Campbell to bring in. Uh, the one big change we, we've had at the moment is we've brought uh, Charlotte Clark in as a backup goalkeeper because our, um, well, the lady we had on loan for Brighton, she's gone back to Brighton. I think they've got a couple of injuries. Um, do you know much about her, Emma? Uh, I don't actually. I, I think from what from what I've spoken to people about, I think they, they believe that she's probably at a level at least at the same as Katie Startup, who's gone back to Brighton, or perhaps a level above in terms of her development. Um, she's certainly a goalkeeper that I think they've had their eye on and they're quite excited by. But um, yeah, as I say, she's very, I think she's very early on in terms of her sort of development into kind of professional football and full-time football. So um, yeah, one for her to work on. And I think with, you know, with the goalkeeping department at Liverpool at the moment, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really strong, especially with Rachel Laws and obviously Riley when she comes back. Um, yeah, it's really, really strong. So I think uh, I think she's one that the club are just looking to kind of develop and just to provide a bit of support for the um, for the goalkeepers that, that Liverpool already have. Yeah, I mean, she's got a good goal to learn from. And um, Rachel Laws, I mean, I saw for the Conter Cup game against uh, Blackburn, Rachel didn't play, uh, but she was doing the full warm-up with uh, Startup. And it, it was like having the coach on the pitch. She was stopping drills to set, tell her, just it, obviously technical goalkeeper things, which I won't understand, but... That's kind of that sort of thing, what you want, that little bit of motivation. You can tell she took that into the game and she probably did make a mistake for their goal, but Rachel's the one that's taking this one side to have a word, to have a word, you know, goalkeeper to goalkeeper. So, you know, if you've got to learn from a goalkeeper, Rachel is probably one of the best to learn from. She's comfortably the best goalkeeper in the division. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. But then flicking it to the other side of the age of the pitch is the youth that we've got coming through now at the moment is really exciting. Um and basically, just makes you talk about uh, Hannah Silcock, who I've heard good things about. I finally got to see her in the flesh against Blackburn, and you don't want to get too excited about a young player. But my God, you know when I watched her play, I think Steve, who was sitting next to the match, gave the best description was she reminds you the way she plays of a Joel Matip, and she's only seventeen, eighteen. She's so calm, so physical. Dominant, I was thinking, and she was leading the line. This line was like Raza Roberts and Michaela Moore next to it, and she's telling them where they're going, which is like it's a nice thing to see for Liverpool that even in these Conscript games, we're seeing two or three youngsters getting dropped in, even being Lucy Parry, who's playing right wing back. 
and you look at them going, a couple of years' time, you're going, they're, they're, they're ready made at the moment. Touch wood, all things going well. But that's another nice side to see that is we are still getting to see some youth come through as well as experience. So we're not sort of relaxed, so we can sort of get the mix right, which is always what you want for Liverpool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think it was it, it was really good performance. Like you say, she looked like yeah, a little bit perhaps dramatic it is is a good player to sort of compare her with because yeah, I guess the first thing that jumped out of her was was kind of that ability to play out from the back and she was really comfortable on the ball. She had really good vision. She was seeing those early passes and um I think anything that you kind of want to see in a in a in a centre back, especially one that's playing in a back three in a side that is playing at the top of the table is one who not only you know thinks about the defensive side but also thinks about how they can turn that transition play into a very quick counter attack and that's really important for Liverpool and the way that they play. We've spoken about it before in terms of like Taylor Hines sort of you know that's one of the best things that that she provides for this Liverpool team is not only does she do the defensive work but she turns those transitions into attacks so so quickly and yeah that was that was something which really jumped out for me but I still think she has a lot of work to do positionally mm. um she got caught in behind a few times um perhaps at eagerness at times to to play those balls you know quickly um was you know not always on um and that's something which which she'll learn um she's obviously you know a young exciting player but you can tell she's got all the all the right qualities there so yeah really good stuff the most important thing in that back three is the ability to play football as well, because they all have to take turns moving into midfield. And that's going to be the situation at any level and at any age. You know, if you're going to do that and you're going to make that shape work, the ability to step into midfield with the ball and also without the ball at times to follow someone a long, long way. It's the thing that, for instance, Leanne Robe has been brilliant at this season. She's known when she needs to go all the way with someone and and really sort of hunt them down and, and press them and force them either into, into into a mistake or force them into into, into giving it back and, and, and give Liverpool time to go and get set. So I think that's the most important thing is, is that confidence to be able to go and play football over a period of time. Obviously, at the minute, I mean, we're Suddenly there is, you know, there's an embarrassment to riches uh, at centre half there. I'd say, you know, Michaela Moore's probably fourth choice uh, at the moment, uh, but she's getting opportunities, which is good, you know. So there's time for Hannah, obviously, you know, if she's at this point sitting sort of fifth choice, then there's there's time for her to to, to keep learning the position. And hopefully there'll be the games as well uh, to come around that. But we'll, you know, obviously we'll have to see. Definitely, yeah. I mean, speaking of uh, embarrassment of riches of young players, I mean, one of the uh, key players for us this year has been uh, this person, Missy, Missy Bo, I mean the fans absolutely adore. I mean having a local, having a local playing for you as well always helps. But um, it's been a it's been a good good season for us so far. Um, she's had to buy the time though. You know she has had the highs of being, you know, the youngest ever uh, captain for Liverpool in the Conti Cups. But recently she's had to learn to buy the time because um, she's lost a place to Rachel Finesse for probably the more physical games in Durham and Sunderland, which probably suits Rachel's. Um, abilities better but for such a young player she she looks really excited and the key thing for her is she's been given a hard job playing in that midfield too with Kerry, with Kerry Holland playing in that too you've you've got to have the work rate you've got to have the discipline and you know for a young player she's she's done really really well yeah, she's, she really has. She's battled. And I think it's interesting that she has, is having a game selected for her. And I think that that's better than the idea that she's got to she's got to be the one all the time. I don't think we want that for her. I think, again, for her own development, her being managed and coaxed into performances is better than, than being relied upon. Um, you know, I think that she may not feel like that. Trust me, she may not feel like that. But... Nope. I think within that, the the idea that Liverpool can pick and choose the games for that partner, mostly that partner for Kerry Holland, if we're honest, you know, she appears to be the one that is that is exceptionally difficult for the manager to bring himself to drop. But I think that being that being an option there is important. And so I think I think for Kearns, you know, the, the big thing that she's got is a staggering amount of awareness. She's she's really, really on top of where everybody is on the pitch. She's able to pass expansively or attempt to. I think sometimes it goes astray, but that's the nature of passing expansively. You know, if you're going to be the one who's going to try and move the play forward 30, 40 yards, you've got to accept that sometimes the run won't be quite what you anticipated or your ball won't be quite the perfect one. But there has been a lot of discipline shown when she's been in that midfield too. I th- you know, you, you can be impressed with when the games have got sticky, which they have occasionally for Liverpool. You know, it's not been, this hasn't been Liverpool just running downhill. Mm. A lot of these wins are two goal wins where the, the second has sealed the deal 
from Liverpool's point of view, but it's been a long time coming. And she's dug in really impressively. So I think she's shown first and foremost, the one thing she isn't is a luxury, but I think it does help her to, you know, to do 30 in one game, 60 in another, 90 in another, to have that sort of selected for her by the manager. I think that that will help with the development over the longer term. We are back to the conversation of whether or not there's enough games at times and Liverpool will have prepared for the idea that they are playing Charlton this week, only to have that game taken from them. But I think it is, I think it is a real sort of opportunity for, for, for Cairns to be able to grow both in light and also occasionally uh, in dark. Yeah, quickly spot on. Um, and what's your sort of points on um, Missy? Missy yeah, Bowen. like I, I agree with a lot of what of, of what Neil said. I think one thing you could say is, while he's absolutely right, you know, there's there's clearly not enough games. That November period, which was a bit busier, you know, she has probably been one of the, those players that's played a lot of football over the last couple of seasons. She's now playing international football this season as well with the return of the England under-23 setup. So I felt um, it being busy I helped Liverpool, Emma. I felt everyone yeah. had rhythm. Every mm. player who came in had rhythm. And I thought that, you know, they stuttered a little bit first half against Burnley and then they find themselves. But I genuinely felt every player was, you know, everyone was involved. Everyone was playing games mm. of football here and there, 20 minutes here, a full game there. I thought that it being busy really just helped Liverpool. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it really helped with that momentum, didn't it? And that consistency in the side. And I think, yeah, and I think it's really good. But then I also think on the flip side, it provides that opportunity that we were discussing before for Matt to not necessarily play the same 11 every week. You know, it by rotation, it's not necessarily, you know, dropping Missy. You know, it could just be go, oh, right, mm-hmm. we're going to give you half an hour this week because, we, you know, Rachel Furness needs some minutes so that she's, you know, sharp and she's got that consistency as, as Neil said, of, of playing all those games. So I think it's just, you know, it's it's switching in and swapping out those midfielders. I don't think it's a case of, you know, one starts every week and they have to start, bar maybe Kerry. But Kerry is, she's got the athletic qualities. We know that she can play probably perhaps a little bit longer than than the majority of the players in, in the league because she's just got that fitness level, which is just so high coming from the United States. So um, I think that's, you know, that's, that's where Missy will probably develop is that, she will probably learn when to manage in games in terms of her herself. You know, we see her running around, you know, working hard, perhaps at sometimes running around like a bit like a headless chicken, which she probably doesn't need to do as much these days. And I think in the past, that's something that she's probably done a little bit more is that she's been working like super, super hard for like the full 90 mm-hmm. minutes. And what, what Rachel Finesse is really good and what she's learned with her experience and perhaps with her age is that in the times in the game when you can, you know, not be pressing high and intense all the time and just slow the game down a little bit, keep possession for a bit. That's what she's really good at. And against teams like Durham, where you just need to, you know, chop and change the tempo a little bit. I think, I think that really helps. And I think that's something that Missy still needs to learn a little bit. I think so. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, there's, there's always the odd one out in the midfield at the moment, unfortunately for her, it's been Jay Bailey, but again, Jay Bailey, when she's come in, especially in the Conte Cup game, she's done really well. I mean, she's Blackburn. She's, probably the best player on the pitch. And there's someone who probably at times isn't playing for two, three weeks at a time. The pr- the good thing for Jade is she probably didn't have the best game against the Lioness early in the season. But when she's got her opportunities now, she is actually at least taking her chance. Now is it is generally now a if it's a shut up shot moment, you bring Jade on. And Jade does really well at that. That is her, her strength, which is, you know, the defensive ass side of the game and shutting the shot and keeping it simple, which is what you want sometimes. But it's why the manager's got horses for courses, both mm. from the bench. And I think the five subs has helped him and helped Liverpool quite significantly over the course of mm. the season. And again, it's that's another reason why the game's come thicker and faster, helps Liverpool as well. I think, you know, ultimately now it's going to be a bit, you know, they're, they're all a bit all dressed up with nowhere to go uh, in the in the Conti Cup game, I think, in the in midweek, because that would have been a ground in for then the big game against Charlton. I think now, obviously, he'll probably go a little bit stronger than he might have done, just simply to give the footballers a game, uh, get something in their legs. But I think around all of that, the thing he's had all the way through is is options, and he's used them, and he's used them really well. Yeah, I agree. I and mean, then, you know, if we're going to, like, horses for courses at the moment, is uh, Raza Roberts, who we've already talked about, but, you know, this is somebody who was... Slightly lost a lost a place to Charlotte Wardlow. Uh, had to had to bide a time a little bit for Charlotte, but then has come back in and quite honestly, um, you know, it's, it's been fantastic. And to be honest, now Charlotte has the, the challenge of can I win the shirt back? And it's quite a nice, healthy position to be in because it's a while since we've been in that position where we've looked at a player and just gone, well, when they're fit, they're playing. Whereas now it's like they're both very good at full right full back or right wing back, but just give you different. They just give you slightly different variants in the game, and it's quite a nice. Nice way to be, really. Yeah, I think I think when Matt first came in, there was an opportunity, especially with Charlotte, to essentially mould her into the exact player that he wanted as part of that 
back three going into a back five or initially that back four. But it was almost like he had a player who was fresh, who didn't have bad habits, who didn't have low confidence, I guess, from the season before. It was just somebody who was essentially the start of a project and he could say, right, this is how I want you to play. Whereas obviously Raza Roberts has got lots of experience. He's played in lots of different sides and lots of different systems. Perhaps Matt Ford, um, you know, I just want to work with her a little bit more. So when she comes in, you know, she can really elevate the team to that next level. It's almost like you just wanted that that grounding. And I think that's kind of what we've seen is that Raza has now come in and not not only is she competing with Charlotte, I I would argue she's been she's taken it to another level. She she has been a, a better better addition to Liverpool's back four, back five, back three, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but I think on the ball, now that Liverpool are more confident as well. I think we get the better out of Razzle Roberts as well in terms of her qualities because we know that she is better going forward. She's got brilliant delivery. We've seen her set pieces. They've obviously led to goals in, in the last month. So we know how good she is on the ball. But the way that Liverpool are now playing with that confidence and looking to play out from the back suits her a lot better than perhaps it would have done at the start of the season when Liverpool was still, you know, getting over the kind of the, the end of last season and just getting to grips with things in the summer. So yeah, I think it's worked, worked really well in terms of that that competition. But actually, like I say, for me, Raza Raza's kind of made that position hers again. Do you think it possibly helps Neil that she's she's now she's now seen basically as the right back or right wing back? That's where Raza's seen. Probably before that, she was seen as a bit more of a utility player where she could play DM, she could play centre back, she could play full back, and she was used as fill the gap a bit of a fill the gaps in because we can put Raza there to put that player in there. She was always being moved around. I, I I do wonder the fact now she knows she's either she's basically right side of defence. That's where you play. That's your position this year. I wonder if that helps her a little bit now because she's kind of established. I mean that's where she plays for Wales as well. So it's probably think, more of a natural position for her. I think that does help, but I think that one of the things that helps again is is the shape. I think there's a massive difference between right back and right wing back. And if you're the dominant force, you actually want your right wing back to be able to be a midfielder. And I think that that's what she's been able to bring to this, to be honest with you. I think the more you know, ultimately, Liverpool, we said before about them showing robustness against Durham, and they have shown that, and they've got that. But I think the other thing that they need to obviously do is just ensure the rising above when they can. And having someone who, you know, was able to show last season at times that she was more than able to play centre mid, having that person who, who's got then got the engine to get up and down on that right-hand side, I think it helps massively. And all that, then the next phase of that is knowing when to go and knowing when to stay. And I think that, you know, that's obviously something that Liverpool have worked on. I think the back to passing range, I think that sometimes we can, you know, I think that there's, we've seen in lots of different forms of football, there's a difference between passing and crossing. And I think that she's she's passed the ball very, very nicely from that right-hand side, both little ones sort of dinked in uh, with, a, with, a bit of, with a bit of power around the penalty area, and then the big switches, which obviously bear massive fruit against Durham. So I think all of that helps. You know, she's not, to me, Wardlaw looks like a right back. And I don't mean that as a pejorative at all. She looks like a right back. She looks like somebody who could be a right back in a in a really good back four. Whereas I wouldn't be that comfortable um with Roberts as a as a right back in a in a really good back four at a at a high level. But playing this shape, you know, you need you need you need players who who will be able to genuinely contribute um in the in the in the opponent's final third, not even just the middle third. And I think she's done that job well. Awesome, awesome. So, obviously, we were going to talk about Charleston, but we may as well save that till the actual game happens. <laughs> so, um, we're at the halfway, we're, we're basically for Liverpool, we're at the halfway point now. So, probably just to give those who haven't seen much of the win, win play, uh, who sort of stood out, who sort of impressed me. I mean, everyone will go, the obvious answer is Leanne Keane, which, you know, goals pay the rent, and we can, we can talk, we can wax little key about Leanne, we will do in a minute. Uh, but I think some of the unsung heroes this year have been the spine of us out, which has been Rachel Laws, Leanne Robe, Kerry Holland, that yeah, spine, that spine is what gets us going. And I think Kerry Holland, with... Kerry Holland, all day. To be honest with you, if you're going to knock Leanne Keane out, I think Kerry Holland has just mm. absolutely grabbed this midfield role. I think she's the one who works best with all of them. Uh, whatever the option is, you know, you could bring Carla Humphrey in next to her, and she'd find a way to dovetail. Bring Jade Bailey, and I think she'd be more progressive. You know, I think she she's shown herself to be genuinely multifunctional in there. It's really hard to play centre mid, 3-4-3 at any level because you are left with so much pitch that's your responsibility. Uh, even if the whole side's functioning well, you know, it's a, it's a shape that's on a teeny little bit of a knife edge, especially in the middle of the park. And she's been the one who's been pretty consistently picked. And, you know, I'm I'm, I'm very pro Leanne Robe as well. I think the way she stepped into midfield is different class, but, you know, we can get back around to talking about Leanne as well. But for me, Kerry Holland is the glue that's making that shape work pretty much every single time she's on the pitch. 
I'm going yeah. to jump in and say Taylor Hines because as as yeah. I as I always say in football, I think you know if if people are playing their roles exceptionally well, it helps the roles of others to play exceptionally well. And I think actually by Taylor's uh, form this season, which I think has just been incredible, and what she now offers in a wide position, and like I say, sort of that that ability to to turn transitions into attacks so quickly and to win the ball back and um, you know offer so much going forward. I think actually takes away a lot of the the necessity to go through the middle that Liverpool particularly had last season. And I think that is helping the likes of Kerry Holland and Missy, who who have obviously shone this season in terms of, you know, their jobs and their discipline and, and their work. So um yeah, I think I think we can all have an argument for all of them. But uh, yeah, yeah, Taylor for me. And she's adding yeah. goals as well. Yeah. Did it did everyone in before we get to Leanne, because I know Neil wants to talk about all the goals, uh, and rightly so, is because uh, she's she's been criticised in the past is Mel Lawley. We've already talked about her, but she's generally this year, every time she gets the ball, you are on the edge of your seat because you're thinking something's going to happen, whether it's a free kick, an assist, a goal, or she's or, you know, or they're going to try and take her out. And she's roast that challenge. I think she it's something like she looks like now she just enjoys being arguably the best the best attacker in the league from a wide position because nobody wants nobody can stop her when she's in full flight. The- there's definitely truth in that, and to go back to what Emma's just said, you know, where where the manager's ended up, and it's interesting, you know, he's ended up in a playing a way where there aren't actually that many parachutes. And Mel Lawley is another mm. example of that. You know, you, she's got a bit. If she's not pulling her weight, then then Liverpool would find themselves in a fair bit of trouble because they wouldn't have an outlet that helps them get up the pitch on mass. You know, you can do the same thing with Taylor. I think it's an excellent point. You know, you can do the same thing in the middle of the park. There's only possibly really the idea of the centre half should always feel as though they've got a bit of cover. But everyone else has got to has got to really be be contributing to it to a very high level, and it's it leads to a lot of responsibility being taken. It's interesting, you know, having watched the women's game in, in greater and greater detail across the last couple of years at this level and occasionally at a WSL level and international level. There's a lot a lot of sides that play four two three one, and what playing four two three one does is it means that every it means that pretty much everyone in the two and the three feels like they've got a little bit of an escape hatch. If it isn't going well for them that day, they can they can they can glide a tiny little bit and you know you'll see you'll see midfielders drop in to cover full backs and, and holding midfielders come in and cover full backs as well uh, over the course of matches. This the way Liverpool are playing at the minute, as I say, everyone bar possibly the three centre halves, and they even they are bold in terms of how they step into midfield. But everyone bar the three centre halves has got to be performing. If they are not playing well, then they will expose their side going both ways. And so I think that really what the managers ended up ended up doing here is having a formation, having a shape and an approach that really puts responsibility on his footballers. And I think that's exciting to watch. You know, at times the score lines haven't been quite as free flowing as they could have been for Liverpool. But to watch a group of footballers effectively repeatedly find themselves and on mass, you know, eight or nine of them every week win their direct personal battle every single week, I think is really impressive. And I think that's that is that that's testament to them, first and foremost, testament to the togetherness of them. Because as I say, if any one of them, you know, had a bad half an hour and it has happened occasionally, you suddenly are going to expose a lot of other players because they can't cover for each other, they can't be shuttling across. No one is spare apart from possibly one centre back. Totally agree, totally agree. Right, just before we get to Leanne, because I know you're desperate, um, Rachel Laws, just to give her a, a shout out, um, that is what that is what a top goalkeeper does for you. Because in those Durham games and the Sunderland games, not only is it, it's not just a save, the communication, she will dig a teammate out. She's not, af- she's not afraid to dig a teammate out. And she is the master, I think, of delaying a ball without getting booked. I've never seen <laughs> someone delay a ball so much and a referee falls for it every time. Yeah, you know, no, she's, she, she's fantastic. She's very, good at, she's very good at the dark arts, but like, I, it's you know, it all comes back to that point that, that Neil's just said there, where I think by having this kind of high risk football and high risk, you know, formation, I guess, um, you need to have a good goalkeeper. You know, the men's side do it with, with Allison. You know, they they play progressive football from the back, and they know that's because they've got a world class goalkeeper. So if it does go wrong, well, you know, that's not essentially what you're planning for. It's you know you feel a little bit more safer knowing that you've got a goalkeeper who can who can who can turn up when when she needs to, and I think that's 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 really really important for Liverpool, and that's something which um, they've kind of like you know made the most of because as we said before, I think the goalkeeping department at Liverpool is by far the strongest in the league. I don't think there's any club that's even anywhere remotely close to um, when Liverpool have Riley Foster back having those those two goalkeepers. So. 
yeah, yeah. why not? Why not? The, 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 the difference, the, I mean, you know, there's lots of differences in the Durham game. Liverpool deserve to win full stop, but ultimately, one of the key differences in the Durham game is Rachel Laws is far better than the Durham counterpart. Yeah. Far better, like you know, and that's that makes a difference. Uh, you know, the, the the nature of the Durham counterparts was a massive aspect of what Liverpool chose to do tactically when they were, were attacking. They felt that they had a really bad weakness going across to a far post from the right hand side, and it bears fruit twice for Liverpool. And it could have it could have borne fruit more than that. That's not to say she doesn't make a couple of really good saves because she does. But Rachel Laws is a goalkeeper who you know I, I don't want to sort of almost go too far in a sense, but she's almost a goalkeeper without fault. There's no obvious weakness at all that you see it occasionally. Someone will beat her. You know, it happens in football all the time, but it's very difficult to look at her as a keeper and say, well, she doesn't look great in this scenario. She doesn't look great in this scenario. You know, she looks really good with the ball at her feet. She's commanding. She's very much gets the line set where she wants it. Um, she's more than happy to, she's more than happy, as you said before, to, to, to kill a game. She's got tons of experience around that. But her positioning's excellent. Her hands are excellent. Um, you know, there's, there's, you can whip the ball in under the crossbar. She backs herself all the time. You can decide to go for long range efforts. She constantly got her feet moving. She is, you know, uh, people will beat Rachel Laws over the course of the season. And if Liverpool go far in the cups and begin to play better and better sides, then it'll get easier and easier in a sense to beat them because the opportunities they get will get stronger. But Liverpool, I think, are in a situation where, you know, if it's going to take a, a world class effort from distance to beat her, um, then it will need to be a world class effort from distance to beat her, which in the Championship is obviously less likely to happen than it is in the WSL. You know, she's at the very least seven, eight out of ten at absolutely everything, and that's at the very least. And I think that that's, you know, this is this is a rock between that and and, and the idea that you've got the top scorer. You know, if 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 in any division, <laughs> any level of any game of football, if most of the time you go on the pitch, you feel as though you've got the best goal scorer and you've got the best goal keeper then it does not help you relax into everything else that's going on in the game yeah, get, yeah. games are won in, in in both boxes that's that's what you hear people say all the time and it's yeah. true because if you've got the best goal scorer and you've got the best goalkeeper then you've got the best chance of scoring goal at one and then saving it at the other and 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 Lawsy has this ability as well where she you know isn't necessarily involved for you know half an hour 20 minutes and she can still pull it out of the bag and i think that is crucially important as well and she's remarkably brave mm. yeah she took, I mean, Durham, Sunderland, anti Burnley. She she took some hits, and she still keeps still keeps getting up for them. I think for one of the games, I think it was um, I think it was the Lewis game. She hadn't trained all week. You wouldn't know. You yeah. wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah, that's what what she's made of. So we'll talk about having the best striker, best attacker at the other end. So Neil, you'll remember this. Uh, you very kindly asked to come on your post match show. So it was me and John. And he said, what do you think of Leanne Kiernan? And I said, oh, she's great. She works really hard. She's a bit like Dirk Cout, though. Works really hard. Probably was, doesn't get enough goals. That's how football makes you look really stupid. And I'm quite happy to look stupid. Yeah. And someone could prove me completely wrong. Uh, so Leanne Kiernan, fabulous. That, Absolutely yeah, fabulous. I, th I think the thing that's happened for her is she's just in, began to enjoy gambling. And I think that in those earlier games, there wasn't there wasn't quite as much gambling. And when there was, she she just wasn't getting the result that she needed from the gamble. All of a sudden, I think that you know the gambling's paying dividends. And then from there, you grow, you feel confident, you feel better, you feel like you're you, you know you feel there or thereabouts. And then before you know where you are, things are beginning to drop to you. I actually think she's just a teeny bit also now in opponents' heads. I think it's 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 human nature to, to to be very conscious that you're coming up against the top scorer in the division. Uh, what's our plan? What what are we going to do for that? But I think you've seen that sort of those ghosting runs, really, that seem to go from, you know, she she appears really rather marked in the penalty area to there's literally no one near her. And you're not quite sure what's changed in the meantime. You know, I think she's quite happy to let the action almost go past her sometimes and look to go another way. I think Liverpool have, have, have you know, as, as a collective deserve credit for that. But then the next phase of that means you've got to take the opportunities. And if it's bundling over the line or if it's smacking it in, whichever way that is, she's been doing that as well. I'm, I think that she can really continue to grow for this Liverpool side. I think that she's she's happy to also be selfless. She's happy to find herself out just doing a little bit of right wing for five minutes because the play's just sort of broken that way. She's not shouting at people to say, get me back inside. She'll keep looking after that if someone else has ended up through the middle for a minute or two. I think that, you know, she's obviously you need the goals to continue. The goals do pay the rent and she is very much, very important to Liverpool paying the rent currently. But she's also working in an all round sense and you know, I don't see, I don't see quite what stops her in the league. To be honest with you, now I think that the other part of this is she gets to play now a lot of teams again in the second half of the season, which she's already scored past. And I think that that will also help confidence, help gambling, and Liverpool do look to have a bit of a plan as to how they're going to involve her in games. Definitely, definitely. I mean, the only thing I've noticed different. I know what you're saying. She does go wide. If anything, she was 
probably too hard a worker. She would always run the channels too much. I don't know if that's because of Rihanna Dean being injured. They've changed that, but she's he's definitely it's more the width of the penalty area now. She occupies. Oh yeah, that's that's, a bit that's, where she, that's where she wants to be. But my point is more mm. she's not. You know, if if the play ends up that way because there's just been movement, yeah, she's yeah. not screaming at people to sort of get herself back in. Uh, I think, that, and I think that that's you know that's helpful and it's good for her teammates. But yeah, no, very much so. She she views herself. I think it is fair to say. Uh, yeah. as someone who's going who's to play between the sticks. Yeah, just on that, because I was thinking this when, when Neil was talking, I remember having a really interesting conversation with the Arsenal manager about Beth Mead and the way that, you know, in terms of her increasing her goals contribution for, for them this season. And I think it's quite similar in terms of Leanne because the way that Arsenal play in terms of pressing high up as a unit and the work that they do off the ball and how organised they are off the ball, it's almost like they take risks in higher positions in the pitch to win the ball back higher. And therefore... If attackers lose the ball, um, the the chances of winning it back in a dangerous area are also increased. And I yeah. think I think we see this now with with Liverpool a little bit more this season. I think, and that's maybe the difference between the start and you know and now is that off the ball as a unit, Liverpool weren't quite at it. I don't think at the start of the season in terms of the way that they pressed and their positional play and and obviously the work that they were doing in the system. Whereas I think now everyone knows their jobs; they're doing them to a high level. And as Neil said before, a lot of the times they're winning those pers- those personal battles. So not only is Leanne now having a, a you know more of a freedom in terms of being able to take risks because she knows that Liverpool are strong off the ball as a unit to win it back in dangerous areas. But I think she's now also finding herself more in the middle at the crucial moments because off the ball, positionally, Liverpool all round as a unit are just much better. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. It's it's just nice to see Liverpool with a a regular goal scorer because we've like I said we've probably not had one since Beth England. We're Beth England alone. Yeah, but that's yeah. we're talking quite we're talking three, four, at least four years now since we can hand on heart say that's that that that's all who's going to get us guaranteed goals. You know, so it's a, it's a lovely position to be in. Uh, right. So just before we go, uh, Emma, anything exciting coming up from you on the BBC? Oh, there's always something exciting. Coming up from you. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, nothing in the short term. I don't think that would um, interest local fans, but I will have my usual WSL transfer piece coming out at the end of December. And I always add in a few lines about Liverpool in there. So I'd keep your eye on that. Okay, good, good, good. And Neil, um, obviously, Anfield Raps always busy. Um, anything exciting coming up? We'll be doing a little bit of a sort of a year-end summary at some point. Uh, the the fact that there isn't a game this weekend now gives us a fair bit of time to do it. Like it's the sort of thing you can also do in January uh, because they're not playing again until the ninth. So that's coming up uh, around the women's team. I just think in general, you know, the, it's a it's a side at the moment to be excited by, and you know, it's it's a shame that the Charlton game isn't going to go ahead. But the the next one for everyone to have their eye on, I think, certainly if they can get a good result against Blackburn uh, in January away is there's, there's there's a home game against Watford which could be a good game to bring people to uh, if you've been thinking about it you know I'm not we don't need to get carried away here but Watford are bottom of the league so the idea to maybe get a few more goals right in front of us as you said before Chris yeah, yeah. you know it's nice not, it's, yeah it's a chance it's a chance in that game against Watford you know Liverpool can the next phase for this side is to to start really uh, really building a couple of score lines up as well because this is a team that I think is very nearly and if the next block of games, sort of the one this weekend that they're not going to take part in and the next couple strongly go Liverpool's way, we're not too far away from a lot of sides sort of writing the rest of the season off and beginning to plan for next. I think if Liverpool can look as though, you know, if you're playing against Liverpool, you're happy just to lose 2-0, then I think that, that's, that, that, that happened to Leicester last season. And I think that if Liverpool can get to that sort of point, then, you know, it, it can really help us reach all of our ambitions for the rest of the campaign. That's right. And Neil, you'd be pleased to know my language around my daughter has been very, very good. Because I've, 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 I've had nothing to get stressed over. I've been quite relaxed and, you know, she's worried I'm about I'm sure she'll be well. relieved, Chris. I'm sure she'll be relieved. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it won't last, though. I'm sure I'll be getting told off soon. <laughs> cool. So just before we go, uh, on a personal note, I just want to say a big thank you to Neil and to Emma and to Philip, unfortunately not on the show today, for giving up their time and, you know, helping me start this show off because, you know, it's uh, new, new, to, new to me all this. So, you know, thanks very much for uh, helping me out. It's been a pleasure, Chris. Yeah. Thanks. Have a lovely Christmas. <laughs> no worries. The rest of you then, please have a good Christmas and make sure you catch the Reds um, when they're back in the new year. <laughs>